Good evening and welcome to Science Gallery Bengaluru's public lecture series, which is a part of our exhibition season on contagion. Science Gallery Bengaluru is a public institution for research-based engagement and contagion is our first fully online exhibition season where we are trying to explore the transmission of ideas, emotions, behaviors, and most relevant to the current moment that we are experiencing diseases as well. Today's lecture is a part of a 23 lecture series supported by the Indian National Science Academy. And we are grateful to Professor Chandrima Shah for her support in this endeavor. Today's lecture is a much awaited one by Professor Gagandeep Kang. She will be speaking about COVID-19 vaccines, present and the future. Before I introduce Professor Kang, allow me to tell you about our upcoming programs. We have a lecture by Christos Linteris on Saturday and in the same time slot at 6.30 on plague and the emergence of epidemic photography. We have on Sunday at 5 p.m. a discussion between the filmmaker, a Bangalore filmmaker T. Jayashree and the journalist Vikram Doctor at 5 p.m. This is about her film on HIV AIDS called A Human Question. We will broadcast a discussion live at 5 p.m. on YouTube and invite questions from the audience for a live discussion at 5.45 on Zoom. This weekend's program comes to an end on Sunday, the 30th May at 6.30 p.m. with a lecture by Girish Shahane on the art of pandemics. And of course, we'll be back next week. Professor Gagandeep Kang is a professor of microbiology at the Wellcome Trust Research Laboratory and the Division of Gastrointestinal Sciences at the Christian Medical College, Vellore. She is also the first Indian female scientist to be elected fellow of the Royal Society. With her team, she conducts interdisciplinary research on enteric infections and child health. She works on gut infections in children, focusing on issues of nutrition, water, and sanitation. She has built a team that does everything from geographic information systems to human immunology. They have evaluated vaccines in preclinical and clinical phase one to three studies for rotavirus and cholera, and are now working on typhoid and SARS-CoV-2. Do remember to type in your questions in the Q&A box and give us your feedback because that is what will keep us on track. With this, allow me to invite Professor Kang for today's lecture. Over to you, Garandeep. Thank you, Janvi. I'm really looking forward to what I hope will be a conversation between all of us. I think we've had a pretty incredible time in the last year and a bit and there isn't necessarily an end in sight even though what we are seeing from some countries around the world you can vaccinate your way out of a pandemic we don't know yet how long that will last but all the signs are looking really really good we have reason for a great deal of optimism so the way I'm planning to go through this is to talk about where we started from in terms of vaccines, where we are now, and where we are going as far as we know. Now, where we started from is actually goes back much further than the smallpox vaccine in 1796, because the principle that was used which allowed for China and India to be able to handle smallpox was inoculation or insufflation, essentially taking the scabs that formed when the vesicles of smallpox were drying up, grinding them into a powder and then breathing them into your nose or cutting the skin and rubbing them in. That was a bit of a chancy process because while some people developed a few lesions and survived, uh, others went ahead and got really severe disease and died. It was not a bad process at all, just really, really not quality controlled in any way. 
So Edward Jenner's experiments in 1796 were a significant advance because you didn't have to use smallpox. He used his observations about the smooth skin of milkmaids to take material from the cowpox lesion of a milkmaid, inoculate that into his gardener's son, wait two months, and when the vesicles of cowpox had disappeared, inoculate him with smallpox and see whether he got sick or not. He did not, and we had vaccines. From 1796, things moved really, really fast. And they moved fast because of the sheer burden of smallpox. In Europe alone, where the population was a lot smaller than it is today, 400,000 people died every year of smallpox. And how quickly things moved is that in four years, vaccines were being given across Europe and North America. By 1900, 100 years later, smallpox had been eliminated from much of the industrialized world. It then took us about 75 years to be able to deliver those same vaccines in middle-income countries and in low-income countries. And in 1979, after a few years of being clear of smallpox, we declared smallpox eradicated. And so far, it's the first human disease to ever have been eradicated. So with this kind of experience, we know, or we should know, the value of prevention. But when it comes to thinking about the situation that we are in today with outbreaks, with epidemics and pandemics, in the mid 1950s, the world thought that infectious diseases had been conquered. And there really was no reason for us to continue to worry about infections in much of the world. We were proven wrong for both bacteria and viruses and particularly where outbreaks are concerned, because the number and diversity of outbreaks has really increased over the last 30 years. From AIDS onwards, it's been a long litany of infections after infections. And the reason that we are seeing many of these infections, a lot of them are coming to us from animals, animal spillover, and then adaptation and spread in the human population. And why does this animal spillover happen now when we've lived with animals throughout history? Well, we travel more, we interact with people for trade more, we live in places that are more and more densely populated as our population expands. We have a lot more conflict that results in human displacement. We migrate a lot for economic reasons or to escape other forms of deprivation. We are cutting down our forests again for economic reasons and everything that we do with all the wonderful new technologies of the last couple of hundred years is resulting in climate change. Essentially, in the last 20 years, we've really had a new era where the risk of epidemics and pandemics has only increased. Now, most of the large outbreaks that travel easily are caused by viruses. If we look at this year's global risk report from the World Economic Forum, infectious diseases figures as number four as a top risk by likelihood. And it, in terms of impact, it is on top. Since 2000, we have had intercontinental spread of SARS-CoV, of H1N1 or swine flu, of MERS coronaviruses, of Ebola, of Zika, and now of SARS-CoV-2. Now, if we look at Ebola in West Africa in 2014, 2015, Ebola has been around. It was it first identified in the 1970s. And after that has caused many, many outbreaks. Say, unpredictable, but every few years in forest dwelling communities, you will have a small outbreak of Ebola 
And the way the Ebola outbreaks are handled is by isolating the area that is affected and essentially waiting for the disease to burn itself out. It was recognized early on that a lot of Ebola transmission happens from person to person, particularly when bodies are prepared for burial. And the washing of the body, the close contact with a dead body of someone infected with Ebola leads to a great deal of transmission. Now, interruption of those practices can result in a decrease in Ebola. But what happened in 2014 was a change in that well known pattern of Ebola outbreaks because, for the first time, Ebola came to cities in West Africa. And in cities with dense populations in close contact with each other, it was easy for the virus to spread from person to person. We had an outbreak that badly affected three countries, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. And the interesting thing with Ebola was that while we knew that infection control practices could arrest Ebola transmission, we also knew that there were vaccines and antibodies that had been developed for Ebola that were sitting in freezers in different parts of the world. For Ebola, a vaccine had been developed in the late 1990s and was ready in the early 2000s. It was transferred in the mid 2000s to a US company but the company did not see fit to take that vaccine forward for development because they didn't know how many doses of the vaccine would be needed, when they would be needed, where they would be needed. And developing a vaccine is a very significant investment. So this small company did not want to do that. When Ebola hit, the world got together and said, we need to try out every intervention we have because we don't want Ebola traveling to other parts of the world. So plasma therapy was tried, antibodies were tried, and vaccines were tried. The only problem was by the time we got our act together and actually started to have vaccine trials, the epidemic was on the downswing. So it took many years to finally have the vaccines evaluated. The key results became available in about three, four months from starting the trial, but it took a few more years before that vaccine could be licensed. Now, when the world looked at the Ebola experience and said, okay, what have we learned from this? They decided that they should be thinking about what should be done to control epidemics. The other thing that people discuss is why do we need vaccines where in the case of Ebola, other approaches worked at least as well, if not better than vaccines. We managed SARS-CoV, we managed H1N1, we managed Zika, we managed them Ebola and we managed them without vaccines. Well, those diseases for one or the other reason were different from SARS-CoV-2. In the case of SARS-CoV-1, the difference was that in SARS-CoV-1, you had spread of disease from person to person only after a person got sick. If you were not sick, you could not spread the infection to anyone else. In SARS-CoV-2, we know that it's very possible for people to be infected, be shedding virus, and not be sick. So that is a large difference. In H1N1, hugely transmissible virus caused asymptomatic infections. Why didn't we need a vaccine? Well, because the disease actually, though we were scared of it initially, was very transmissible, but also very mild. So we were able to get away with only the rich world vaccinating themselves and in poorer parts of the world, the morbidity and the mortality, the effect of this infection was so low that we could get away without the vaccines. 
In the case of Zika, again, it looked like it was going to be a very serious issue in many parts of the world. But Zika is a vector-borne disease. So you have multiple opportunities for control of Zika infections. And Zika, in effect, burnt itself out by infecting everybody that it was likely to infect. In the case of Ebola, infection control practices were what was really responsible for shutting down the 2014-15 epidemic. But subsequent to that, we've had multiple outbreaks of Ebola, particularly in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where vaccines have been the key element used for control of the outbreak and they've been remarkably successful. Now, if you have an option, I must admit that I'm a convert. So I think prevention is better than cure. I'd really rather not get sick than get sick and then need medicines for that. The other thing about vaccines is that for vaccines, it's possible to think about preparedness and you can predict how much of a vaccine is going to be required in different scenarios. Whereas if you have a new infection coming up, you don't necessarily understand how much of a response is going to be required in different areas. Will, for example, nursing care mitigate how badly or how well a disease does in a particular area? And there are other challenges in epidemics that relate to the scale of the response. What are the needs for testing, for screening? Do you have trained staff? Is there surge capacity in hospitals? Do you have enough people, enough resources? And then as we've seen, even with SARS-CoV-2, when all of healthcare focuses on one disease, what is the impact on other programs? So in response to Ebola, a new initiative was formed called the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations or CEPI. And the idea here was let's make vaccines before they are needed. Let's think about what the next threats are going to look like and see what we can do to be ready to use these vaccines when the outbreaks actually happen. And let's do this in a way that allows us to be equitable in the distribution of vaccines. It shouldn't be about rich countries protecting themselves while poor countries have to bear the brunt of any pandemic or epidemic. So CEPI, and I'm vice chair of the board of CEPI, was established about four years ago and started to fund projects in 2018 and in 2019. It works very closely with the World Health Organization and all the pathogens that it looks at are pathogens that have been identified by WHO as key infectious disease threats. So as you can see here, there were five viruses that were being worked on by CEPI. And there was also something called the Disease X program or the Platform Technology Program, which was a rapid response program. If we don't know what the disease is, if we get the sequence of that agent, can we really quickly design a vaccine? And fortunately, there were multiple programs that had been funded for MERS coronavirus. So a lot was understood from SARS about the importance of the spike protein. And a lot was understood from the MERS programs about how to make a coronavirus vaccine. So all of these were transitioned to SARS-CoV-2 programs. The AstraZeneca vaccine is one example of that. The Moderna vaccine is another one. And BioNTech was also uh, working on different vaccines with CEPI. So three projects which were approved about two weeks after the sequence of the virus was known, and now there are a dozen. 
So where are we now in terms of vaccines? CEPI is only one of the players, but it's an international player, unlike the others that are country specific. We've had over 300 vaccines in various stages of development. Currently, we have 51 vaccines being evaluated in humans for safety, 37 for safety and immune response, 27 for efficacy, and we have seven vaccines in limited use and eight vaccines that have been approved for full use under emergency use authorizations. Now, usually when you set out to make a vaccine, the general estimate is nine out of 10 vaccines are going to fail. And as you can see here, you have over 100 vaccines that have gone into clinical trials and you already have eight successes and only four vaccines that have been abandoned after coming into human studies. So the success rate for vaccines for SARS-CoV-2 has been really, really high. Now, what are the platforms that we have? We have what I call the old technology platforms, which is the top row, and the new technology platforms, which is the bottom row. In the top row are platforms where you give either the whole virus or parts of the virus to people in the hope that you will induce an immune response. And that in the case of live or inactivated vaccines consists of lots of different proteins. And in virus-like particles, recombinant DNA, et cetera, consists of only a few proteins. Then at the bottom, you have vaccines where you essentially send in a message and tell the host cell, the person who's being vaccinated, this is how you make the spike protein of SARS coronavirus 2. And then the cells of the vaccinated person start to make not the whole virus, but just the spike protein release it to the outside and that induces an immune response, which is protective. So when we started this time last year, May 2020, we worked with WHO on a target product profile where we hoped to have a vaccine with at least 50% efficacy. And we were saying at least 50% efficacy because we were trying to learn from influenza where in influenza, if you get a vaccine that has 60% efficacy, that's fantastic. 50% efficacy is also pretty good. Given the severity of SARS-CoV-2, we thought we were setting a pretty high bar when we said 50% efficacy. As we know now, we have lots and lots and lots of vaccines with efficacy data. And we are all playing this game of saying is 90% better than 60%, but that one in this study showed this number. What are all these numbers and questions that we have about how vaccines are doing? And I think a lot of the data on vaccines is not only just about the number that you get out of phase three efficacy trials, but about what is currently unknown, which is how long does protection last with each of these vaccine candidates? So many of these vaccines have started to be used in different parts of the world. Among them, we have inactivated vaccines, older technology. The only one that I will focus on is Bharat Biotech's vaccine, which is Covaxin. It received a restricted use approval in January this year. And the interim analysis for efficacy shows that it gives about 78% protection. This vaccine is now approved in five countries and is being used in India. About 10% of all vaccinations in India are with this vaccine. There are also other vaccines, mainly vaccines from China that are being used in the Middle East and in Southeast Asia, and they seem to be performing well. 
in Brazil, where the vaccines have been used, there has been some doubts about the performance of the vaccines against some of the variants. Now, the protein subunit vaccines, well, you know, the Novavax results when they came out, this is a vaccine where you use moth cells or insect cells to grow the spike protein. It kind of comes out of those cells and then folds itself into the, a pretty looking flower, which is actually a nanoparticle that is made up of spike proteins. So this uh, vaccine had really good results, 96% against the older version of the virus, 86% against B117, 51% in non-HIV infected in South Africa. Now, unfortunately, that vaccine, Novavax is a company that had not had a successful vaccine product before. And fortunately, their filing has been delayed and we don't know when this vaccine will be available, but when it's available, it will be made also in India as Covavax, and we expect a very large number of doses. Now, moving on to mRNA vaccines, these have been the blockbuster success stories of this pandemic. We never had an mRNA vaccine for humans before. Now we've got vaccines that show us 95% efficacy in clinical trials. They've been evaluated in children. The Pfizer vaccine is being used in 12 and above in the US. And these vaccines are also being made as new versions of vaccines with the variants. And the nice thing about them seems to be that they seem to start working 10 days after you give the first dose of the vaccine. Now, these vaccines have had a really interesting development because as soon as they were successful, everybody wanted these vaccines. And Israel got ahead of the pack, essentially by agreeing to turn the country into a living laboratory for Pfizer, share data with Pfizer. So these data, and I'm not going to walk you through all of them, essentially show that whether you look at infection or you look at illness, severe illness, there is a huge reduction among vaccinated people. These vaccines really are working and start working really quickly. And Israel has continued to share data that is informing us about the safety and efficacy of these vaccines. Then we have the viral vectored vaccines. The first adenovirus vectored vaccine was actually one for Ebola, and that was licensed in 2020. And the AstraZeneca University of Oxford vaccine made by Serum Institute of India as Covishield is the second vaccine to be licensed. And this, the studies were a bit messy, but as I'll show you, in the real world, these vaccines are working very well. The Gamalaya vaccine, which has just come to India, also seems to be working very well in phase three trials. And then we have a Janssen vaccine, which is going to be made by another Indian company that also is working well and is so far the only single dose vaccine we have. Now, when vaccines are evaluated in clinical trials, a lot depends on how the clinical trial is set up. You know, what does a fever mean? Who measures fever how? Do you use a digital thermometer? Do you wait for people to say that they have fever? So there can be a fair amount of variation. So what you really need is for vaccines to be evaluated independently after they've come into real use in the world by people who apply the same methods to all vaccines, not the companies evaluating the vaccines. So these are data from Scotland and the UK. Essentially, they show that the AstraZeneca and the Pfizer BioNTech vaccines worked very, very similarly, which was kind of surprising given that they were different in the phase three clinical trial. They were able to protect against severe disease about 80%, even in older individuals, 
and the effectiveness against any symptomatic disease was about 60%. There are lots of questions about dosing intervals and we can discuss those, but in terms of data that has been available from clinical trials, we have a lot of variation. And from the real world data so far, most of the data is on people who used a 12 week interval. Not only was there a reduction in severe disease and death, even in the elderly, one of the really interesting things was that both the Pfizer and the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine cut spread in households by half two weeks after the first dose of the vaccine. And this in public health terms is really, really important. Vaccines are intended to protect the individual from illness. That's their primary goal. And if they prevent that, we are happy. But if you can also decrease transmission, if you can stop spread of disease, not just by having few, fewer people who get sick, but even among those infected, stop them from transmitting, then you really have a fantastic public health tool. And that's what these vaccines seem to do. Households are high transmission settings. If you can reduce spread there by half, then you're in a really good place to control the pandemic. In the real world, you also get to see safety issues that you wouldn't have seen in the trials, even though the trials had 30, 40,000 people in them. So what we are seeing is that you get a very severe allergic reaction which is very, very rare, one in 100,000 or one in 300,000 with the mRNA vaccines. And you have another rare finding with the adenovirus vector vaccines, which is AstraZeneca and Johnson and & Johnson, where you get thrombosis with a low platelet count. In India also, we have mechanisms for reviewing these safety issues but they tend to be not as detailed as the kinds of reviews that are done in other parts of the world. So in India, we have three vaccines and our, we have to choose between them. The pricing depends on who buys and where you get the vaccine. About 90% of what we've used so far is Covishield, 10% is Covaxin and Sputnik V has just come in and that's enough to immunize currently about 150,000 people. After this, there will be manufacture in India and then we will have more doses of the vaccine. Now, globally, if we look at COVID-19 vaccine use, this is a broad picture of where the vaccines are, Oxford, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Sinopharm and Moderna. Uh, vaccines that have been approved by the WHO. The other vaccines are awaiting WHO approval, and those include J&J, um, &J, uh, Bharat has just submitted their data, and Gamalaya and Sinovac are also currently under review. So where are we going as far as we know? Well, variants are a big issue. They keep coming up. We still have more vaccines to come. We don't know the duration of protection. We are just beginning to learn about mix and match schedules. Vaccine hesitancy is an increasing problem in India and elsewhere. And then we have unknown unknowns. So I'm just going to walk you quickly through variants and future vaccines. And in terms of the last four bullet points, I can't really address them because the data are just about beginning to emerge for some of those. So the first thing is variants sound scary, but variants arise when viruses multiply. They are very common and most of them don't matter at all. Occasionally you get a variant that does matter, and those variants are the ones where there is not only a change in the RNA, there's also a change in the behavior of the virus. It becomes more infectious, it causes more disease, 
It leads to vaccines not working or drugs not working or diagnostic tests not working. And seen here is a tree that illustrates when these various variants started to emerge. And 21A in the very bright red is the variant known as B1617. So what can happen with variants and vaccines? Well, actually vaccines are working really well for a mucosal infection and the viruses are evolving to become more transmissible and there is some evidence and we've seen this with B117, we've seen this with B1617. But B1351 does not necessarily seem to be that much more transmissible. Viruses have also evolved to try to escape the immune response, and that's been seen to variable extents with a couple of the variants, B1351 and P1. And the data on B1617 seems to be a little bit um, strange. It has two mutations that could lead to immune escape, but the data that we're getting from different laboratories seems to be very different. And it has three sub-lineages, uh, one, two, and three. And if you look at the data from the UK shown here in the graph, you can see that it seems to be outcompeting or in some sense taking over from the variant that was circulating in the UK previously, which had emerged as a significant concern in December which is B117. So how are vaccines working against the variant? We've just started to get real life data. In Qatar, where they are using the Pfizer vaccine, there is 89% protection against B117, 75% against B1351, and it's 100% protection against severe or fatal infections. In Israel, also using the Pfizer vaccine, 97% against B117 and for B1351, sorry, two weeks after the second dose, there were no cases, which looks like 100% protection. In the UK, the most recent data that's got everybody in a twist is really um, effectiveness against infection with B16172 is about 17% lower and about 6% lower after two doses when compared with B117. Very important to point out that there is no data on severe disease and vaccines usually perform much better against severe disease. So there are vaccines that are yet to come, some in clinical development that I will describe quickly some in preclinical development, and then the idea that next time around, could we make a vaccine in a hundred days? I actually think that with the science we have, that's possible. In India, we are testing what is the what could be the first DNA vaccine for humans. And this is made by Zydus Cadilla. It's currently in phase three trials. Every week, I hope that we are going to get the results. That week hasn't happened yet, but I believe that we are really close. The Novavax vaccine I've already mentioned, so I won't go into that, but biologically is making another protein vaccine, which is now in phase three results where we might have um, phase three trials where we might have results in August. And if that happens, then these are vaccines that can easily be made in hundreds of millions of doses every month. We also have in India, the first company that's making a RNA vaccine. And this is Genova. They're making a self-amplifying RNA vaccine, which essentially means you need to give a little bit and it will grow by itself to induce an immune response within it induce more RNA and then a larger amount of protein and immune response. This is also interesting because it's a vaccine that can be kept at room temperature and they have now started phase one studies and are establishing manufacturing. Now, why bother with more vaccines? If we've already got so many, 
Why should we be doing more? I think every time you start on vaccine development and somebody else succeeds, you have to make a call on whether you're going to proceed or not. I think at this stage, it's too early to stop many of the programs that are in development because we don't know how many kinds of vaccines we're going to need. We won't know which vaccines we should be choosing to use. The early vaccines might not necessarily be the best vaccines. So if we want durable immune responses, perhaps we should continue to look. We were able to move very fast because we've been studying protein structure and the human immune response in great detail over the last 20 years. And this is a legacy of HIV. Because we've tried so hard and failed so far to develop a vaccine for HIV, all the learnings we had along the way allowed us to move rapidly with vaccine development for SARS-CoV-2. So one was that vaccinology has advanced and this sets us up really well for the future. And the second is we have organizational preparedness now. A lot of the things we didn't think it was going to be possible to make a vaccine against a brand new pathogen in 10 months and we managed to do it. Now, what is really our next challenge? Can we make a 100 day vaccine? The Moderna vaccine was designed in two days, produced in six weeks. It was the clinical testing that took a long time. The clinical testing was also some of the largest clinical trials that have ever been done. So what kinds of trials and regulatory systems do we need in case we want to make vaccines faster? I think a known known is that we are going to have pandemics. What it's going to be, we don't know yet. There, we have had on average one major viral pathogen disrupting the world or parts of the world every three years for the last 20 years. So you know, it's not like we're suddenly going to get lucky after this. We don't know what's next. Do we need a vaccine for every outbreak? I think we just got lucky with this one. We had a virus that was very amenable to making a vaccine. We may not be so lucky next time. So we really need to think about pandemic preparedness beyond vaccines. There's a lot that we have done in the last year. There's a lot that we really need to be doing. And the time to start thinking about that is now. Even as we continue our vaccination programs and try to protect those who are most vulnerable in our society, we should also be building up for as much preparedness as we can manage. And we need to do that as a global community and not individuals or nations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gagandeep, for a lucid and succinct and precise overview on what it is that we have learned about vaccines, what it is that we knew, what it is that has happened, and what it is that might happen. So moving on from here to questions, and as Gagandeep very generously said earlier, the, earlier today, she loves questions, so please keep them coming. So we have um, one, okay, so Rajiv Patil would like to know, can mRNA vaccines cause genetic problems for future generations? So I think a lot of people have these doubts about vaccines when we hear about vaccines that are made of essentially the same things that are found in nuclear material. So, but one thing about mRNA vaccines that's important to note is that these mRNA vaccines don't go to the nucleus. They get inside cells and then they go to the ribosomes, which are the protein factories of the cell, and instruct them about how to make proteins. And they can't do this. It's a single cycle 
where they give these instructions to the ribosomes and say, make this protein. Here's the message. Read this message and go do your work. That's what the cell does. So there is no integration of the mRNA with the actual genetic material that is in any cell. So you can't inherit anything from an mRNA vaccine and it doesn't persist. So in animal model studies, in human studies, people have looked to see does all the mRNA get used up or not? Well, actually mRNA is a very fragile sort of molecule. And the reason we didn't have RNA vaccines earlier was because we couldn't protect the RNA to get it inside cells. It would get broken down before it got to the cell. It's only after we learned that if you take the mRNA, stabilize it, and then wrap it in this lipid nanoparticle, kind of like a fatty blob, then give that to the cell, then it will get in. It will survive that long and get in. So there's very little chance that anything can happen with RNA. DNA vaccines is something else that people worry about because we know that DNA is genetic material for everything except a few RNA viruses. And with DNA, what's done is the vaccines are engineered. So DNA is usually carried in on a plasmid. A plasmid is an extra piece of DNA, which is usually in the form of a circle. And a part of that circle has the sequence for the spike protein or any other protein you're interested in. So plasmids usually don't go into chromosomes. They are extra chromosomal genetic elements, but even there to make sure that they have no opportunity to get inside the actual chromosome, they are engineered to be unable to integrate. They cannot get inside DNA. And again, studies have been done to see that there is no integration of DNA from these uh, vaccines into the host genetic material. Okay. Uh, Anshuman Rustagi has a question which I think many people have asked you many times in many places, but I'll anyway allow for that question because it is a question on the minds of many people, which is the um, gaps between doses. So Anshuman's specific question is that those who went in to get a dose at a slightly reduced interval, would they require a third booster at some stage? Like say, for example, for Covishield at five to six weeks or for uh, Covaxin, um, again, four weeks as opposed to six weeks, et cetera. Yeah, so I think the one thing that everybody has to understand is that we are still learning. We are learning a lot about these vaccines. And if we don't design our experiments, and these are ex essentially treating people as human guinea pigs, which is required to have any new vaccines or treatments, we are not going to have answers. Now, specifically to what Anshuma is asking is, well, you know, the vaccine trial that was done in the US was a vaccine trial that was done in 30,000 people. And they got the vaccine at a four week interval. And the efficacy of the vaccine was above 75%. So you have nothing to worry about. Why do we keep the interval longer? We keep it longer because we are basing our understanding of what the interval should be on immune response studies that show that if you have a prolonged interval between those two doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine, you get a significant improvement in the immune response. Does that translate to improved efficacy? We actually don't know yet. We do know that one dose gives you pretty good protection for everything except maybe, you know, we still don't know about 6172. But even against B117, you're getting 60% protection with one dose uh, 
against symptomatic infection, 80% protection against severe disease. So I'm expecting that even against B16172, we'll probably have at least 60, 50, 60% protection against severe disease with a single dose. So what can we do when we immunize the entire country with one dose or two doses? Could we do a single dose evaluation? That's mm -hmm. something people are thinking about. After all, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is an adenovirus vectored vaccine with a single dose. That's giving pretty good protection. Would the AstraZeneca vaccine give it, you know, do you need that second dose and do you need it immediately? We actually don't know. Could we have managed with one? We never evaluated one, so we can't answer that question. Hmm. So I think the basic thing for everybody, advice is, don't worry about the dosing interval. If you've got two doses of the vaccine, don't worry about getting a third dose. We will have more information by the end of the year. We know that the vaccines are protecting very well. It's not like protection, you know, it's not a switch. It's not going to suddenly stop. Hmm. And there are people and vaccination programs that started well ahead of India. We hmm. have learned a lot from them. We'll continue to learn from them. If we need to bring in a booster, we'll bring in a booster. Hmm. But right now, there's no evidence that anyone needs a booster. So a related uh, question or that of uh, pre-existing conditions. So there are two very specific questions that people ask. And one of them is, is again, very generally asked and one of them is specific here. Um, what about people who have, say, for example, a precondition of deep pain thrombosis or like uh, or autoimmune diseases, like say, for example, lupus? Would any of the vaccines be contraindicated um, in these circumstances? Simple answer is no, and I'll go over it in a little more detail. So let's start with the people with a clotting disorder. Hmm. Now, the specific side effect that you see with the AstraZeneca vaccine is thrombosis with thrombocytopenia. So you get a clot and you get a decreased platelet count. And the reason that you're getting the decreased platelet count is because some people make antibodies to platelet factor four. This is also known when some people who are given heparin as an anticoagulant, they also make antibodies to platelet factor four. So really, if you want to diagnose whether this clotting condition is related to vaccination or not, you need three things. You need evidence of the clot, you need the decreased platelet count, and you need antibodies to platelet factor four. Just a clot or just a low platelet count do not indicate that the condition that you're seeing is necessarily related to vaccination. A lot of people think, you know, if I've got bruising after I got the vaccine, is that a side effect? Mm -hmm. That's usually just bad injection technique. So not uh, necessarily that you've got a clot and you've got low platelet counts and need to worry. The other thing is it happens within a narrow window, which is four to 20 days, usually after the first dose. So if you get let's say somebody who has a stroke three months after they got vaccinated, it's very unlikely to be related to the vaccination. Hmm. So that is that condition. The other is contraindications. Right now, the only contraindication is somebody who has an allergic reaction to the first dose of the vaccine. And here is a situation where, you know, we know that with Moderna, with the uh, Pfizer vaccines, it may be um, PEG, which is a compound that's used for stabilization of the vaccine particles, may be responsible, polyethylene glycol. Now, polyethylene glycol is in a lot of food, in a lot of other substances as well. And we don't know who's likely to have that reaction, but usually it happens within 30 minutes. 
and it can be handled quite easily without um, any issues. Now, if you have other allergic reactions, are you more likely to have this? No. Anybody with food allergies, drug allergies, that does not predict that you will have this anaphylactic reaction. People with autoimmunity, no condition, whether it is thyroiditis or you know any other autoimmune condition, that is not a contraindication for vaccination. A lot of people who have autoimmune disease are on immunosuppressant drugs. There is some emerging evidence that if you are taking methotrexate, it may lead to a lower response to the vaccine, but that doesn't mean you should not get the vaccine. The same for people who are immunocompromised because they are transplanted, um, need to take long-term steroids, etc. Your immune response might not be as good. And there's some discussion now whether we should try prime boost, you know, mix and match strategies for people who are immunocompromised. Mm. But right now there's no clarity on that. And definitely at least go get your primary series. Then when we figure out whether a booster is required for those people, mm. we'll have guidance. Okay. So there's a question about escape immune lines of defense and escape. Uh, uh, okay, let me read the question properly. Um, vaccines other than live attenuated and inactivated whole virion vaccines, um, there are other vaccine types which will facilitate selective propagation of viral mutants that have acquired increased infectivity to circumvent and escape the immune lines of defense. What would you say to that? I think I need to read the question a little more carefully. Because yes, that's I'm what I thought as well. It. Um, I will paste so, it for you into yeah. the chat box for you to read it. Uh, but in the mean, maybe we should we should move ahead and because there are lots of questions and. Um, I mean, if this is arising from Geert van der Bosse's statement about vaccines and vaccines that should not be used in pandemics, mm. then I have to, uh, you know, at least the construct that he has of the immune system and how vaccines induce protection is flawed. And mm. most immunologists would be able to explain that quite easily. I'd be happy to um, take some extra time to explain it to whoever the question is from. Okay. Can you please elaborate on antibody dependent enhancements and if there is any relationship between mass vaccination and ADE? Um, the simple thing is no. Antibody dependent enhancement just means that if you made an immune response and it wasn't strong enough or it weakened over time, when you get reinfected, you might wind up with the antibodies actually allowing the virus to get inside cells that they would not normally, normally infect, multiply to a high level and cause very severe disease. This happens in dengue and has been known to happen in a few other viral infections as well. With SARS-CoV-2, we have no evidence that anything like this is happening. And one way that all the vaccines have been designed to guard against this is to make sure that vaccines induce a high titer of neutralizing antibodies. So you need antibodies that can block viruses getting into cells. So if you have lots of that kind of antibody, the virus can't infect cells. ADE happens when you have antibodies that don't block virus entry into cells. So <laughs> that is not happening with the vaccines we have currently. Um, there are many questions about mixing. Can we mix an mRNA vaccine with other kinds of vaccines? Can I take a co-vaccin after a Covishield or a Pfizer, etc.? Is there? I can do a generic one. Yes, that's what I thought. Yeah. The generic one is um, there are a series of studies that have been started to look at mixing studies. So, your first two doses, if they are of two different vaccines, 
is that the same as, is it better than, worse than having two of the same, right? Mm -hmm. And so far, there's only a little bit of data that has come from the from people who had the AstraZeneca vaccine and then were given a dose of Pfizer vaccine eight weeks later, and they made a really good immune response. Is that does that mean they are better protected? They will be protected for longer? We don't know. But these are the kinds of experiments that we absolutely should be doing to be able to figure out what our best approaches are. We got the vaccines made very quick but we haven't learned yet the best ways to use them so we need to do that kind of experiment so there's someone asking and i don't know if this is the right question to bring to you but i'll ask it anyway and you can let me know what might be the reasons for reinfection for someone who's had sars cov 2 and gets it the second time and how does one understand vaccination in this context? Or when does one take vaccination after being infected as well? So one thing is important to remember is that some parts of your body are sterile and other parts are not. Hmm. Your upper respiratory tract, your gut, your genital tract, your skin are not sterile and are never going to be. So if I sampled people's hands day after day after day, I would find bugs on them that cause disease. Similarly, if I keep sampling the nose, I will find bugs that will cause disease. That does not mean you are sick with them. It just means that you are carrying them mm -hmm. and they have been found because we test it. So if you have repeated asymptomatic infections, you've tested positive, that means nothing. If you have test positive and mild infection, that also means very little. And in most situations where you have been vaccinated, you received one or two doses of vaccine and you get infected after that. Most of the people that we look at uh, do well with that infection. It's really mild because the vaccines have modified the illness that you would have had. In a small proportion of people, you can wind up with severe disease and you can wind up with people dying. And that's because vaccines are not perfect. Mm -hmm. When we say 80% efficacy, we mean vaccines are preventing 80% of disease, not 100% of disease. Okay, so the, the biggest determinant of how sick people are going to get is how much protection they have from prior infection or vaccination and how much disease is circulating around them. If there are very few infected people around you, your chances of infection are lower. If there are many infected people around you, your chances of infection are higher. Now, when it comes to if you've been infected, when should you take vaccine? So far, the data we have shows that if you've had an infection, you have about 84% protection against reinfection and disease for at least seven months. Mm -hmm. So essentially being infected is like having had a dose of vaccine. Mm -hmm. So you can afford to wait to get your vaccine. The guidance from different regulatory authorities about when you should take the vaccine is different. The CDC says, take it as soon as you are better after you have recovered from your illness. WHO said initially six months, maybe revising that to three months. The mm -hmm. Indian government says three months. In terms of an immune response, I would say the gap between infection and vaccination, if you want to maximize what your immune system can do, then give it a gap. Hmm. Ruhi Soni has an interesting, good question. She's, she's a budding science journalist and she wants to ask you if there's anything you wish reporters understood about vaccines, COVID or otherwise, when they write about it. Um, it depends on the quality of reporters, because I find that lots of reporters have really done their homework, are very well up on what's happening. 
uh, with vaccines and ask really, really smart questions. I think originally when we started off, the difference between infection in, in, in microbiology, infection is you've got the bug. Disease is you've got the bug and you're sick. So the difference between infection and disease post-vaccination was something that people found initially a little difficult to understand. So I guess we should call it symptomatic infection and asymptomatic infection. Uh, oh my God, there are about 60 questions. I don't think we are going to be able to uh, go through all of them. Um, Ah. So there's a, there's a very, it's a very fundamental question. Again, I'm seeing it repeated again and again in different words, which is that if there is so much doubt and if there is so much room for concern around a vaccine efficacy, and you've said this in so many words, uh, Professor Khan, a few minutes ago, uh, but the question still is, should a common man take the vaccine or not? And I, I think we know the answer, but it would be good to sort of probably... So I think the most important thing to recognize is that vaccines work to prevent disease, particularly prevent severe disease. I am, you know, I've worked in vaccines for 20 plus years and in infectious diseases for 30 plus years. I have never been so happy with the science of vaccines. Because we've made so many different kinds of vaccines. They've worked beyond our wildest expectations. Now what we are doing effectively with all of this is trying to set the bar even higher. We want the vaccine to be perfect. We want the vaccine to give us even more protection. We want the vaccine to be even safer. You know, we have no doubts about polio vaccine. We give it to children every year. The oral polio vaccine causes polio. In one in two million children, one in a million children, yeah, it does. But we accept that risk. And now we are saying we are not going to accept risks with this vaccine. Well, I'm sorry, but you know, zinc is not 100% safe. Hmm. Aspirin isn't 100% safe. Okay. Vitamin D can cause toxicity. So let's be real, there is nothing, even water taken to excess, hmm. it can kill you. Yeah, um, another question that I'm seeing sort of repeated again and again is how is, how is efficacy arrived at? In a sense, how is the claim to efficacy of a vaccine arrived at? Could you explain that a little bit in detail? Sure. So let's take 2,000 people, okay? A thousand of them get the vaccine, a thousand don't get the vaccine. They get a sham vaccine, so you don't know which one is which. Now let's say that if we are going to follow them up for six months, we expect that in that six month period, a hundred people will get infected. So to the people whom you've given the sham vaccine to, you should expect 100 infections because the sham vaccine should do nothing for stopping infection. Now, suppose you get the 100 out of 1,000 sham vaccinated individuals, you get that. That's your unexposed people being giving you the basal rate of disease. Then you look to see in the vaccinated people, how much disease did you get? Did you get 50? Did you get 10? If you got 50, your vaccine is 50% efficacious. If you got 10, your vaccine is 90% efficacious. It does not mean 90% efficacy does not mean that 900 people did not get sick and 100 people got sick. It means that in that population of 1,000 people, you should have expected to see 100 cases, but you actually saw only 10. I, I trust that was a clear answer and, and you know that clarifies to many people who are asking the same question as to how this is how this is done. I'm going to ask you 
the last question for the evening for the simple reason that we are aware that you have a tutorial session with young um, with our with our young adults starting in you know uh, in a very short time period so i'll ask you the last question which takes vaccines but actually goes a little bit beyond vaccines where someone has said here that professor kang mentioned towards the end of her talk that vaccines are not the only way to prepare for a future pandemic why it is an important way to prepare for a future pandemic could she elaborate around other preparedness modalities that um, yeah so let's look at diagnostics if you look back a year ago even a year ago we barely had enough diagnostics in this country mm. if you don't know that a disease is there you can't measure the disease then how do you even begin to address it or know that any interventions that you have done have had some effect so i think surveillance and diagnostic tools are important i think data is very important even today in this pandemic i if i want to know details of who got infected where how sick they got whether they had been vaccinated before i cannot find that in any one location and data systems don't seem to talk to each other so preparing for pandemics really requires better data better diagnostics better surveillance and then the one thing that i think has been hugely neglected in this pandemic particularly in india where we've gone a little bit haywire is treatment because before you can begin to use vaccines you have to manage the people who are sick and to be able to start with managing them uh, you go with what you know but over time you should be refining that and you should refine it by doing the right kinds of clinical research mm -hmm. you shouldn't be introducing new treatments without testing them appropriately in india today we have over 400 clinical trials that have been registered mm -hmm. i can tell you that except for the vaccine trials none of them are going to give us a result that we can use the placid trial for plasma that icmr did gave a clear answer but after that there every trial is 100 people 150 people you're not going to get answers for treating a pandemic with that small a number so there's lots to do beyond vaccines thank you very much kavindi for taking the time to be with us this evening for generously sharing what you know but also engaging in questions that i'm fairly certain have been asked of you again and again and again and pretty much every single day so i thank you again for that i'm sorry for those of you whose questions i couldn't take hopefully some of them were covered because many many were repetitive but there are at least 60 other pending questions which we couldn't take um i trust you will find that that uh, gagandeep is equally generous um and she she does engage frequently um in the public domain to answer questions so do catch her next time uh, there's a podcast that has been recently released um uh, by audiomatic the people who in fact led well organized the first science podcast with samant subramaniam and patna parna kosh and uh, gagandeep's again done a wonderful 12 minute podcast with them that's available it's in the chat box so those of you um who want to should also listen to it to answer some further questions thank you again gagandeep and thank you again for all of you for being with us on a friday evening and um asking questions that without a doubt are actually quite terrifying for most of us because they involve the lives and you know the care of our loved ones and people close to us some of whom some of us have been unlucky and lost some of them so these are matters incredibly important to us and we are grateful that we've had someone like yourself um to be with us this evening thank you again and i trust you will be you will all be back for the next lectures tomorrow do give us your feedback and do come and visit our exhibits some of which like wendell stanley's lindau lecture um and others speak very much directly to the kind of matters that uh, kagandeep discussed with us this evening thank you again and have a good evening <laughs>